If we hop over to Visual Studio, the player input is the same click to move we've done in AI Series Part 1 and several other videos. I'm not going to go over how this works. Please check out AI Series Part 1 if you want to understand how click to move works. So we'll open up the AI Manager. This is going to be the main thing that we're going to work on here. And an important thing that we're going to do is add an attribute called default execution order and set that value to be zero by default. This allows us to order the normal lifecycle of a script with the awake, start, on enable, all that kind of stuff. It'll call these in this order that we define here. And I'll get to why that's important when we talk about the AI unit. So the AI manager is gonna be a mono behavior, mostly for this demo. This could potentially be a normal C-sharp script in your game, depending on what other functionality you need here. But for this, we're gonna keep it as a mono behavior and we're gonna make it a singleton. So that's a private static AI manager underscore instance and a public static AI manager capital instance with a getter that just returns the underscore instance and a private setter that will assign underscore instance to the value. We'll also add a public transform target, a public float radius around target to be a multiplier for how far away from the actual target we want our enemies to circle and a public list of AI unit units. And we'll set that to be a new list of AI units by default. Now, if you watched the last video, AI series part 26, this probably looks familiar and you have a hunch on how we're going to approach this. We're going to do a very, very similar thing as we did last time. On awake, we'll handle the singleton and do if capital instance equals null. If it is null, then we will assign the instance to be this and then return. Otherwise, we're going to destroy this game object because we only want one AI manager. Then we'll define the magic on GUI. And in there, we'll do an if GUI dot button, passing a new rect of 20, 20, 250. That's X, Y, width, and height. And a string that says move to target. And all this GUI button does is renders a GUI button at the position we specified with that text. And whenever we click it, it will return true. We're going to want our, all of our agents to circle our target. We'll then define the private void make agent circle target. Do for int i equals zero, i less than units dot count, i plus plus. And in here, all we're going to do is say units index by i dot move to, and then we're going to pass to them a position. And it's going to be a different position for each agent because we want them to circle our target. And that vector three, we're going to do target dot position dot x plus radius around target times mathf.cosine passing in two times mathf.pi times i divided by the units.count. And I'm going to explain that a little bit, but let's finish up this vector three. We're going to pass for the y to be the target.position.y, and for the z, we'll pass target.position.z plus radius around target times mathf.sign, passing in two times mathf.pi times i divided by units.count. So what's happening here? We're obviously setting the position we want to move to to be based on the target's current position, but on the X and the Z, what we're doing is adding in additional points or potentially subtracting out additional points based on this radius around the target. To better understand what we're doing here, let me bring up this extremely helpful unit circle diagram that I got off from Wikipedia. This unit circle is called the unit circle because it goes from negative one to positive one on both the X and the Y axis. And what we can see from this is utilizing the cosine function, we can determine what the x value is at any given point. For example, if we pass in zero to the cosine function, you'll see here that we get an x value of one. The y value we can get by passing in zero to the sine function. So all the way around here, you can see the x and y coordinates are the resulting value on the unit circle given an input to cosine and sine. If we also look at this really cool animation I also grabbed from Wikipedia, you can kind of visualize how the two curves relate to one another. Now, I was never particularly good at math, so I'm not going to try to teach you all the nuances of how sine and cosine work. The important takeaway from this is if you pass any value into sine or cosine, you will get back some value between negative one and one. We're using two times pi in here as well because 2 pi is the fundamental period of the sine and cosine functions because, well, cosine and sine are periodic functions and some really smart math guys found out that 2 pi is the fundamental period of them. And that's just a fancy way of saying after you hit the 2 pi amount, it will then repeat whatever you had in the previous period. We're then multiplying that by i over units.count because that will give us a constant increment to multiply by that 2 pi, meaning by the time we get i up to the number of units that we have, we will have made it all the way around that circle and all of our units will be equally spaced on the unit circle around our player. The last thing we should talk about is 
we're mapping the y value, so the sine value, to the z instead of the actual y. And that's because we're dealing with 3D space where x and z are the flat 2D walkable plane. And that's just by convention of how we orient things generally and how Unity does things by default. So y is actually up. Our nav mesh is 2D on the x and z plane. So that's why we're mapping the y value from sine to the z on the nav mesh. Let's now talk about the AI unit. We're going to require component type of nav mesh agent and we'll set the default execution order to be one. And again, I promise I'm going to get to why we're doing this once we hit the awake. I'll add a public nav mesh agent agent. And then here on awake, we'll assign that agent to be agent equals get component nav mesh agent. The only reason I made it public was I have an editor script where I need to reference this agent so we can show the paths. And then we're going to do AI manager .instance .units .add this, And that is why we need the default execution order because we want the AI manager to set itself up with awake before we call awake on AI units. Since generally you can't define what order these get called, Unity just kind of chooses however it wants to for these awake functions. If we don't specifically say we need the AI manager to go before the AI unit, then AI manager.instance will still be null and you'll get a null pointer exception whenever we hit this line. So that's why it's really important to put in the default execution order with the AI unit having a higher default execution order than the AI manager. Finally, let's define the last piece of code we need here. That's public void move to vector three position. And we'll just do agent.set destination to that position. We hop back to the Unity editor. I have an AI manager empty game object here. I'll attach the AI manager script there and drag the player to the target. We'll then open up the unit prefab and attach the AI unit. And then we'll remove that from the player because the player comes from the same prefab. I'll also attach the player input to the camera. I'll set the floor layers to be floor, drag the camera to the camera reference, and the player nav mesh agent to the agent reference. If I then click play, right click to move my player, and then click the move to target, we'll see all of these units come around my player and try to circle him. You can see in the scene view, this white ring of spheres, that's the target locations for all of these units. If I increase the radius around target to something like one, you can see them actually form a circle a little bit better. There are too many units really for the 0.5 to be clear what's happening. So if I increase it to one, you can see that they actually make a circle. If I increase it more to something over two, there's a very well-defined circle around the player that they'll always make sure that they keep that kind of circular path around. We can, of course, change this to lower or higher values, and there's no problem. They'll still keep that circle as best they can. But you might ask yourself, well, what if I have more than one size of agent? Right now, you're only showing me some where the player and the enemies are all the exact same size. Let's open up the navigation panel and add two new agent types. We'll call one the thin agent. So the second one should obviously be the thick agent. We'll make the thin agent be 0.25 radius and a thick agent to be one radius. I'll select some of the nav mesh agents, set them to be the thin agent. I'll scale these nav mesh agents to be a little bit smaller so that way we can tell they're the thin agents. I'll select some different nav mesh agents and set them to have the thick agent type. I'll also scale them to be a little bit larger, maybe 1.5 scale. The other thing I think I'll do is slow down the thicker agents. The thin ones will make move faster and will make the faster, thinner ones have a higher priority, which actually means that they will get pushed by the other agents. And for the ones that I did not change with the agent type, I'll go ahead and change those to have a 51 priority so they can push the thinnest ones, but they will be pushed by the thick ones. And since the player has a priority of one, they will be able to push all the other agents. Because I added two new types, what I need to do is make two new nav mesh services. I'll just copy paste the player one and change the agent type on both of those to be thin and thick agent and bake both of those. And then I'll click play. If I click move to target, we'll see that all the agents try to circle the player still pretty well, but still be that 0.5 radius is too small for it to really show. So if we change it to one, you can see that they are forming a circle around the player. They're not kind of grouping in the middle or they try to avoid it, but really maybe a larger radius here makes sense. If we change it to something like 1.5, they really make a pretty good circle around the player then. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how to make your AI smarter by making them choose positions around the target instead of all of them trying to go to the exact center of the target. If you have been getting value out of this video or the series, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. It's new videos posted every Tuesday. And of course, if you have any questions, if you have a suggestion for a topic, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below. 
and I'll see you on the next video.